Good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Good. It's so nice to see you on this beautiful first Sunday of autumn and also the 19th Sunday after Pentecost. We begin our service every week on sharing joys and concerns that have come in during the week. You've communicated them to me and you've written them on the uh, sign-up sheets in the back of the room if you wanted to share them this morning. I am thrilled to see that the kids have filled out the kids' prayer list a little bit this morning. This is new for just two weeks now, so kiddos, thank you for filling out the prayer request sheet for you all. Let us be in an attitude of prayer. Lord God, it is just refreshing to be here, to be able to be with brothers and sisters um, in you, and just to remember that you're our strength, and that you're our hope, and that the deepest cry of our heart is to be close to you, and to feel your closeness with us. And so I ask God that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you would be close to us, that we would sense your presence, both in our hearts and in our minds. God, I pray for each one of us in the room together this morning, and ask that you'd send us what we need, God, that you give us that, that feeling of comfort, that feeling of hope or strength or challenge that we're in need of. And God, we ask that you'd allow us to be receptive to that, that we wouldn't forget as soon as we walk out the doors after service today, but that we would um, bring your teaching into our weekly life. God, I ask that you would accept our confession this morning. We name out in our hearts uh, what we have done in the past week or more, God, that have grieved you, that have harmed your people or harmed ourselves. We ask, God, that you would just allow us to lay those things to your feet, that we can stand up again and receive your forgiveness, and that we can walk away from them and do better the next time, because we are your disciples, empowered by your Holy Spirit. God, we pray for those for whom are concerned, especially those who are struggling in body. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's now time for the children to come forward. You're going to be doing this in your Sunday school classroom as well. Both um, Amanda is going to be teaching the elementary class, and Sam is teaching the middle school class, and I know that's going to be great for you. So that's where you're going after this. This lesson is about worrying. Do you ever feel worried? Yeah. Yeah, what do you feel worried about? Yeah. My mom gets sick. Yeah, it's worrisome if your mom gets sick. What else do you feel sick about? Yeah. Yeah, having a concussion makes you worry. You can worry about your health. Anything else that you worry about, guys? Injuries in your family? Yeah, it's easy to worry about things, because sometimes things just happen. Okay, so listen to what Jesus said about worrying. One day Jesus spoke to the people and said, Don't worry. Can you say that? Don't worry. Don't worry. God wants you to be happy. Jesus points to this birds chirping around him. Can you make some chirping sounds for me? He said, the birds of the sky do not worry about where their next meal will come from. God takes care of you just as he takes care of the birds. 
Now have Jesus point at the flower. Show me a flower. Uh, flowers are silent. Look at how God has clothed the flowers of the fields. Not even a king looked as beautiful as these flowers. God has provided for the flowers, and he will also make sure you get what you need. Why don't you have more faith, Jesus said. Don't worry about what you will eat or drink or wear. Your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. Instead, Jesus said, spend your time and energy working at following God's way. Love God and follow his rules, and then God will provide for all your needs. Jesus finished his sermon by saying, so don't worry about tomorrow. It has enough worries of its own. There is no need to add trouble to the things each day brings. The main point is, don't worry. Say it again. Don't worry. That can be really hard to do, but it's encouraging to know that Jesus told us, don't do it. All right. Don't do it. Just trust that. Do your best. All right. So you have Sunday school classrooms today. I hope you have an awesome time in your first day of Sunday school. Tell your teachers thank you. All right. Yeah, Amanda and Sam uh, for teaching the lesson. Now let's pray. Lord God, thank you for today. Thank you for these children. And thank you for reminding us that we can trust you, that we need to not worry. We ask that you help these kids have very worry-free lives and days because they trust you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, I 
again, we give you thanks for this time together, and um, I thank you for each of us in the room. God, we ask that through the power of your spirit, you would help interpret this word, and that it would speak right into our lives. And I ask that you would help me to think and to speak clearly. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Marie, just so you know, there's some slides, so just be ready, and I'll just give you another one. I appreciate you. In so many of our great stories, books, or movies, we see a main character that is so compelling, that has an interesting story and a challenge, that has foibles and faults, and we follow through with that main character the whole time, just cheering for them and wanting things to work out for them. And hopefully by the end of the story, there's some wonderful resolution, some satisfying resolution for that main character. In most and many of our best stories and movies, along with this main character, there's a secondary character, a friend, a companion, a sidekick. Sometimes there for comic relief. Sometimes there to be a sounding board. Sometimes there just to hold the bags while the main character does the main thing. We have a way of storytelling and a way of looking at things that has main characters and sidekicks. I'm wondering if you can think of any famous sidekicks. Give me some examples. Hmm? Robin. Robin. Like Batman and Robin. Yeah. Ron Weasley to Harry Potter. Okay, I've got them both so far. Anyone else? Yeah. Sidekicks. Go back to one of your earliest sermons. Linus and Charlie Brown. Yeah, Charlie Brown. Maybe Charlie Brown and Snoopy, or even Snoopy with Woodstock. It's one of those. Yeah. Yeah, that's good, huh? Ed McMahon. Ed McMahon! I love it! Does he have the best laugh? <laughs> that's <laughs> right. <laughs> Ed McMahon for Johnny Carson. Yes? Uh, Chewbacca for Han Solo. Yeah. Chewbacca for Han Solo. An excellent one. <laughs> yeah. We're about to get another uh, version of that story coming up in December, I think. Any other sidekicks you can think of? I have a few. I thought I'd show you. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Marie, show us some sidekicks. Oh, we said that one. See, there he is. Ed McMahon and Johnny. There's Ed. Here's Ed. There he is. Another one. Oh, yeah. What about Ethel and Lucy? I have to say, just as a note, that um, our daughter, Lucille, is not named after Lucille Ball, but I do love that they have the same name because she was such a trailblazer. All right. Ethel. Oh, there you guys got that one, too. Snoopy to Charlie Brown. Chewy? Yes, we're thinking alike. I think there's one more. Oh, there's two more. Anybody know these guys? People my age know them. <laughs> Ferris Bueller and Cameron, right? His sidekick. <laughs> and gosh, one of my absolute favorites, Donkey, uh, voiced by Eddie Murphy in the Shrek movies, right? What a variety he is. Famous sidekicks. And so, with a sidekick, they're supportive of that main character, but usually wouldn't really exist in the story independently. If you took the main character out, you wouldn't have enough to build on. They tend to be flatter characters. Characters were less involved with it because they aren't a part of that main action and that main storyline. I'm going to tell you a story from the book of Genesis about a character that I believe, if we made a movie, would be a sidekick. A, a secondary character, a, a character that is not part of the main story of this book. And this is the story of Hagar. Laura did a great, uh, Laura did a great job of pronouncing those names, by the way. Nice job. The story of Hagar. Hagar appears actually in the story of Abraham and Sarah. Abraham, who is the example and model of faith for us. Abraham, who was told by God, Take all your things and move to a land that I will show you. I'm not going to be specific, but just go to a land that I will show you. And I'm going to make you the father of a great nation. He said, Abraham, look up at the sky and count the stars, and your offspring will be more than the stars. And so Abraham gets up in faith and goes. He trusts God. He trusts God loves him, and what God is saying is true, even though he doesn't have all the details. And so Abraham, after a while, with Sarah and his wife, settles in to Place. And everything is going according to God's word and God's prophecy for Abraham. But there's one small problem, and that's that Sarah has not gotten pregnant. And part of the prophecy is this great nation thing. And so Sarah's aware of the prophecy, too. Sarah's quite a character. I 
don't know, I really think about who I would cast as Sarah. Some really sassy, back talking broad. That's how she is. Um, Sarah says, well, Abraham, I'm getting older by the day here, and I think that God must have forgotten about my fertility problem, and we're supposed to have this great nation. And so in order to make that happen, since God forgot and hasn't noticed, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you, give you, Abraham, my girl, my servant, that I own. I'm going to give her to you so that you can get her pregnant. And because she's mine, she belongs to me, her child is mine. And also your child. And that way we'll get around this thing that God didn't notice. And so everyone's like, okay, <laughs> cute young Egyptian girl, do that. And he gets her pregnant. And this slave girl has, Hagar has a baby. But then, a few years later, 13 years later, actually Sarah becomes pregnant very late in life. She has a son also. She names him Isaac. Isaac has a son, Jacob, who's renamed Israel, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, the ancestor of Jesus. So the main story is Abraham and Sarah have a son named Isaac, who is the father of Jacob, Israel, the father of the 12 tribes, and one of the ancestors of Jesus. That's the main story. But what about Hagar and this little boy that she had? Because truly, she's a tangent. And she doesn't come back. She and her son don't come back much in this book ever again. Not a part of the main action. And so she might have been treated as a sidekick, as unimportant. But that's not how this story is told. First of all, we have to realize that Hagar, we know her name. In a book that focuses on the actions of men, because of when it was written and when the, when the things happened, that names men and often doesn't even mention the fact that they had a wife. And if they had a wife, they didn't have a name. In that kind of book, to have a single young girl with a name is a big deal. Hagar. And we get to get a little insight into Hagar's situation. We understand that she's been a slave her whole life, that she's from Egypt, that area, like Abraham and Sarah, and has moved with them to this new land, so she's far away from her family. We know that she works for no money, she's a slave. We know that not only does she have not have control over her own life and destiny, but she doesn't have control of her own body, because her mistress can say, you go sleep with my husband, and she has to do it, regardless of whether or not she wants to, regardless of whether or not there's a cute boy down the road that she's been looking at. And she gets pregnant. What else we find out in the story is that when she does successfully get pregnant, now she gets a little proud of herself, right? She did something that Sarah couldn't do. And so she starts to back talk a little bit. She starts to be not as submissive as she used to be. She starts to become difficult to handle. And Sarah, this again, was like, she goes over to Abraham and she says, Abraham, this is all your fault. <laughs> Whose idea was it? Abraham, this is all your fault. Now Hagar doesn't pay attention to me anymore. She's no good. And Abraham says, you do what you want. And so Sarah abuses her. It's not descriptive what she does. But she abuses her to the point that pregnant Hagar can't stand suffering anymore. And even though she is single, even though she has no family, even though she's a young girl living at a time where you have to have a father or a husband to provide for you, even though there is such risk, she feels that she is suffering so much she must run away, and so she does, while she gets pregnant. She runs away. And I'm imagining that at that moment, we're given a little glimpse, a scene of Hagar that Lauren read to us, uh, that she sits down next to a spring, we're given a look into there. And I'm imagining that in her mind, she probably feels great relief that she got away from this oppressive situation. But she's probably also really scared, because she does not know how she's going to be provided for. So she has this mixed feeling. And she's crying out to God, and in that moment, another really remarkable thing and unique thing happens to her. is that God speaks directly to her. In this book, God <coughs> speaking directly to people have, happens a few handfuls of times. Not that many times. And yet this young, unmarried girl is one of the people that God speaks directly. Who else does God speak to? Mary? And Hagar? This is an important character. This is an important thing in this story. So God speaks to her and he says, Hagar, I see you there. I have seen your situation. I see your suffering. 
I know your concerns. I know what you're worried about, and I know what you've been experiencing. I know all of that. And I know that you are carrying a child that you did not ask for. But let me tell you about this baby. Let me tell you that you're going to have this son. And this son is going to be the father of many nations. That is what God had promised Abraham about Abraham's son. Your, your son is going to be a great man. Now, there's not a very favorable description of Ishmael. If you've heard the wild donkey of a man, right? But he's going to be influential. He has huge significance. This is who is going to be born. So don't think, I don't want this kid. I didn't ask for this kid because this kid has enormous things in his future. And you are the grandmother of these great nations of people. And I imagine that Sarah's heart just swelled and it was so full because God told her about the success of her son. And God told her more than that. I see you. We know that that's the main takeaway for Hagar because in yet another remarkable thing, this young girl is given naming authority over that place, over that spring. She names that place, God sees me. And then she takes those same thoughts and names her son, God sees me, Ishmael. So her heart is full to know that God loves her and God sees her and God cares. And then God says, I want you to go back to Sarah. Go back and submit to her. What? Wait a minute, God, I thought you just said that you saw me, that you love me, that you care about me. You're telling me I have to go back to that situation of suffering? Don't you want me to be happy? Didn't we just hear that in this kid's lesson? Oh, God wants everybody to be happy and feel good today, right? Don't we think that? Don't you want my happiness, God? You're sending me back there? But she goes. And we have to understand that she must have gone because of that trust and that confidence that she gained in God. I know that while I am going back to a very hard situation, God sees me. God has told me where my future is, and I trust that. And so she goes back into that situation that probably will have suffering in it, saying, I know that God is with me. She goes back changed and different. And I want to have a sidebar here just for a moment. This is coming very, very close to, if you are abused, you go back to a suffering relationship. Very, very close to that boundary. That's not what I'm saying. We don't know how Hagar and Sarah related to each other after she returned. The text is silent. We don't know. But we have to say that this is a God of redemption and healing and wholeness. And if Sarah goes back a different person, that God can also be at work. And if Hagar goes back a different person, Sarah has also been influenced. And we are going to say in faith that relationship did not continue to have the abuse in it. So this is not go back to the person who abuses you. Okay, so she goes back. She lives there. She's with Sarah. Thirteen years later, out comes baby Isaac to Sarah. And Sarah sees Isaac and Ishmael playing together. Big Ishmael, he's 13. He's Wesley's age. So imagine Wesley playing with the baby, okay? And then Sarah, what? I'm trying to figure out who I would cast for Sarah. Somebody tell me after church. Who's, who should be cast as a Sarah? Sarah looks over there, and she gets really jealous. She gets nervous. Sarah's like, oh, my son, Isaac, is going to be the one who inherits the blessing. My son, Isaac, is going to be the father of all nations. I'm getting nervous because I'm seeing a, a pretty big boy over here who's kind of treading in, you know, coming in on my son's inheritance. And so she says to Abraham, I don't like that. Abraham again, oh, okay, go do what you want. So she sends Hagar and Ishmael away. This time, Hagar, with her older son, goes into the desert. They go farther and farther. They run out of water. She sits down, thinking that all her hope is gone. She starts to cry. Ishmael starts to cry. And this time, the text tells us, God heard the boy crying. God heard the boy crying. And God is able to open Sarah's eyes and see a spring so they can get water, so that they can continue on their journey. And God helps them get back to Egypt, where Sarah, Hagar helps to find a wife for her son. And he is indeed the father of great nations. So Hagar did have to go back to Sarah to have that protection for her young boy for that period of time, and then to be able to leave 
and to get him to Egypt to find a wife. And in the process learned that not only does God see her, but that God hears her son. What a blessing. We are in the second week of the Becoming series. Understanding that we are always people who are becoming who we will be in the future. That adults continue to grow and change and what we're doing today has a big influence on who we're going to be in five years. And so we say, who am I becoming? And as people of faith, we want to become more like Jesus. If we're to become more like Jesus, we're going to understand and believe that we have a God who sees and who hears us. That we have a personal God who in God's incredible just magnificence can consider every single person on the planet as a main character. That there are no sidekicks, there are no second string, there are no secondary characters in the kingdom of God. That God looked at Hagar, who is a tangent in the main story of this book, and heard her and saw her and gave her a name and a voice and gave her a legacy. She was not treated as a sidekick. There are no sidekicks in the kingdom of God. And so it's easy enough, and probably for many of us in this room, we've felt this, we've experienced this. God knows me. God has heard me. God has seen me. We've had that experience. And it's fine, you know, if life is going well, you know, you get up on a lovely weekday morning, and you get your cup of coffee, and you look out the window, and you see a beautiful sunrise, and you say, oh, I just feel like God painted that sunrise for me. This is a wonderful day. That's very nice. And things are going well. But when you are crying tears into that cup of coffee because you do not want to face today because of the suffering that you are experiencing, you may find it a lot harder to believe that God sees you and that God hears you. You may default to where Sarah was, saying, God forgot about me. God doesn't notice me. God doesn't see this situation. I'm going to take matters into my own hands. That's what Sarah did. But the story of Hagar is telling us there are no minor characters. You are not a small thing to God. You are a main character in his story. And so when you're crying into that cup of coffee and looking at the sunrise and think, I can't possibly deal with what this day is going to bring me. We need to remember that God sees us and hears us and goes with us back into that situation of difficulty. That we are changed and stronger because we go back with God who is with us. I have seen the one who sees me. We know that we are seen and we go back stronger. And we remember that even if the situation remains difficult for a while, that we're not escaping that suffering immediately, that God is working through that. God is guiding God's plan for our lives along. And so that there will be a time when we see the promise of the future. We pray for that. Not everybody sees that. Let's be real. Not everybody sees it. But we ask God, okay, I'm trying to be obedient. I'm trying to remember that you love me, you hear me, you see me. I'm going back because I believe this is what you're calling me to do. And I'm asking that you allow me to see the time when your promises come to fulfillment. God sees, God hears. There are no sidekicks in the kingdom of God. Be comfort, comforted and be encouraged in your situation. God's calling you to go back. God goes with you. God is working. Amen. Amen. It's time for our offering. Let us pray. Lord God, it's kind of mind-blowing to try to get our brains around the reality that you can see and hear and work with every individual person on this planet. Help us to believe that in faith. Help us to believe that you are working in our lives, that we matter to you that we have not gone by unnoticed. Help us to share this word with friends who may be feeling insignificant or unnoticed. God, we ask that you would receive this offering as our way of saying thank you to you 
We ask that you would bless it and multiply it to your service. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
fall and that season when we get busy swinging back into gear. So a few things uh, to keep in mind. Uh, the first is that there will be a paint night uh, this coming Friday here at the church. It is a fundraiser for the church. It is also an awesome opportunity to invite your friends just to come and experience our community in a very sort of casual way. That's this Friday night. Uh, JJ the artist is looking to firm up his numbers. So if you are thinking of coming, um, the link is in the email, the weekly email, or you can ask me. Um, but he would like advanced registration so that he can bring the right amount of supplies. So thank you for doing that. Um, the books that we are using uh, this year for this year's sermon series are available at, for age level copies. Uh, we have a kids book that I read from during the children's moment. There's a teen version, an adult version. If you're interested in getting a copy of the book so that you could do all the scripture lessons that are contained in each chapter um, and read along with uh, me and the Sunday school kids, just talk to me and we'll get you a copy of that. Uh, on October 4th, which is a Tuesday, we are having an American Red Cross blood drive. John, did you want to say anything about that? Um, I guess that was well said. <laughs> I'm going to say so. If, um, I have some flyers. There's some flyers over there on the coffee table there. If you want to pick up some and uh, make sure to give them to your friends. It is uh, very low in blood right now. It's uh, dangerously low. So if you can give, great. If you can't give, maybe you ask a friend. All right, and I think that's afternoon and evening that the blood drive is happening. If I remember. All right, thank you, Missions Committee, for heading that up. Um, in Saturday, in a few weeks, it is the Taste of North Reading Food Pantry Benefit Dinner that we host, we sponsor as a church. It is being held at St. Teresa's Parish. Um, and not all, they've donated that space, but there'll be food from all kinds of restaurants in North Reading that you can taste for a $25 donation beforehand to $30 at the door. Also, there's a silent auction uh, that benefits our church as a fundraiser. So it's dual purpose. Um, we want to have a big crowd in there. I want at least 125 people. We were close to that the past couple years, so I know we can hit it. Uh, Saturday, October 15th at 6 p.m. There will be a live swing band that rehearses at this space during the year and that they donate their swing band performance, and it's just wonderful. So uh, talk to me if you have questions, if you have silent auction donation items, or if you want tickets. Next week is um, one of two classes for new members. If you have not joined the church and you are thinking about doing that, um, teaching a one-hour class next Sunday after church and also on October 30th after church. So if you're interested in doing that, let me know and uh, we will get that uh, scheduled for next Sunday or October 30th. Those are the announcements that I have. Uh, for celebration and thanks, we'd like to recognize somebody who uh, works because this church is absolutely volunteer-run. Uh, somebody who works in front of the scenes or behind the scenes does something awesome to help Alders Gate be the place that it is. And so I would like to know who has someone they would like to celebrate or thank. Cheryl? Let's thank Marie for stepping in on the soundboard. Cheryl, thanks Marie for soundboard work. Yeah. We are a talented bunch that we have two sound technicians in the church. One of them. Thank you, Marie. Uh, please stand for the benediction. May the God who made us, the God who sees us, the God who hears us, be with us until we meet again. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.